All right, everyone, good morning. How are we doing? A um, couple announcements just to take note of, all right? We are still looking for the small jelly jars, eight ounces, or I was told, was it quart? What was the other one? I don't know. Quart seems like a lot of jelly. It is a quart. Okay. All right, and eight-ounce jelly jars or quarts to donate to the church. We are going to use them for a, um, a special event. And so if you have any, you can donate, uh, preferably washed out without the jam still stuck to the sides. <clears throat> but whatever. We'll still, I'm sure, take it. Um, <clears throat> and then also Operation Christmas Child. This is uh, where the shoe boxes need to be returned by Sunday, November 13th. Does anyone know what today is? Sunday, November 13th, right. So by today, uh, in order that they can be shipped out for delivery, <clears throat> all right, and then the Women's Fellowship meet and greet um, is going to happen here on November 19th from 10 to 1130 in the Fellowship Hall downstairs, okay. I also would like to announce um, that we are going to have baptisms at the last Sunday of the month, okay, the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, our baptisms, and actually uh, my mother-in-law, Nikki's mom, is coming down from New Hampshire. She comes and watches faithfully up while she's up there, and whenever she's here, she comes as well, and she has it in her heart to be baptized. We have had others express interest in baptism, so we will be having that the last Sunday of the month. I also wanted to thank um, Irene and Mark DiGiacomi for all the, the painting that they're doing here. I think the primer is on, and yeah, it looks... <laughs> Makes it feel nice and open in here, right? <clears throat> so I, I appreciate that, and I know we all do. And then our uh, final um, announcement for the day is the uh, F, has to do with the F3 Armor Run, the children's program on Wednesday nights that's going to be starting back up. Do we have Jessica Sylvester here? Oh, Brandy here. I looked back. I didn't see you. I thought you were still getting the water. You don't need a microphone? Well, you have to because online, they got to hear about this exciting announcement. The microphone is not scary. Everybody tell her the microphone is not scary. The, the camera is not even scary. All right, I just want to make a quick announcement that F3 Arm Run is going to be starting up again here in January. And what we're going to be doing is holding a volunteer meeting class on November 28th. It's Monday from 6 to 7.30. There's going to be a sign-up board on the outside. If you have any information and are looking to in, interested in volunteering, not all, the whole program, just once a night or so. Just to get more information, please sign up. Or if you have questions, come talk to me or Jessica. But she's not here right now, but you can reach her on any Sunday as well. Okay? Thank you. See that? Wasn't so bad, was it? All right. All right, everyone. Let's, uh, let's stand when we do the call to worship today. Let's stand and, you know, why do we do a call to worship? Anyone know why we do a, a call to worship? What is it for? What's the purpose? Is it just because we happen to put it in the bulletin? Jennifer, what is it? I, I saw you doing this. Explain this, because I think you're on to something with this. All right. Yeah. Open up our hearts. Get our minds right, as Pastor Don likes to say. Get our hearts right, as I like to say. And so, Eric, yes. you are going to lead us into this call to worship, but we are all going to do this with you. What? Good morning. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting flagged down from the back. Yes, Tiffany, what happened? Technical difficulties. Okay, Pastor Don is going to do the waltz while we wait. <laughs> Would you like to uh, give that a shot? Well, I'm thinking about it, but I'm at least afraid I, you know, I might embarrass myself. You might embarrass yourself. Tiffany's going to give us, you know what, you, we just got the, I was just about, you know, prayer is one of those things where whenever there's the awkward moment of pause, you can say, and let us pray, and everybody just follows suit. But we are good to go. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, like Jennifer saying, let's open up our hearts. Call worship. Call worship. This morning is taken from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make know his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek, seek the, the Lord, Lord and, and his strength, strength and his, his presence, presence continually. continually. Amen.
I didn't know when I was trying to look through songs to do um, how well this particular song was going to fit into the sermon because oftentimes the, you know, the topic's there, but the sermon gets developed a little later. Um, but this song, The Heart of Worship, I think really sums a lot of today. Uh, it's, there's a theme in this, and there's a, a hope in this, and there's a prayer in this. And so I want you to sing it from a place that's deep within.
Thank you for today. Thank you for being able to, to be here, to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for the ups and the downs, the lessons we learn in both. Thank you for moments like these to pour our heart out to you in gratitude and praise. Amen. We're going to receive, you can be seated, everyone. We're going to receive our offering. Please stand and sing our doxology, everyone. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. Lord, thank you for the privilege and honor to be able to give, to be a part of the movement that you are doing here in this church, to be a people under your wing. Lord, we ask you to bless everybody that's given here today and 
not only that, Lord, but take what's been given and multiply it in the way that it produces fruit for your kingdom. Give us wisdom and insight on how to be good stewards of the gifts and the blessings that we lift to you now. Amen. And the young ones, the young ones are ready to learn about Jesus. I can see. Look at how this thing is growing. I, I mean, you want to talk about growth in a church, just look at, there's got to be. And there are sometimes growing pains, you know, that happen along the way. Don't worry, TJ, there's a spot left for you in that junior worship. I can tell you right now, there's a spot left for you, buddy. Oh. You know, you know what's a great lesson in that? There's a great lesson in a child opening their arms up and running to their parent. There's a great spiritual lesson in that when you're afraid and when you feel left behind and when you wonder where your place is there is an amazing lesson spiritually in a child who opens up and runs to their parent and that's how we should be with our heavenly father amen yes. all right everybody we are going to cherish this time of prayer this particular two weeks have been historically for me, and I'm going to be like totally open and honest, difficult ones preaching-wise. I haven't really in the past enjoyed preaching on stewardship. But I don't feel that way today, and I'm going to get more into that soon. Um, but right now, what I would like to do is just ask the Lord to open our hearts. I'm actually going to ask Pastor Don if you would bless us with a prayer um, for receptivity, even as I go to deliver this. Let us pray. Gracious God, you commanded those who would be preachers to not tickle people's ears, but to speak the truth. Lord Jesus, you are the truth, so may he speak of you, and may he speak truths that, that may not be comfortable for people to hear, but they're truths that you want him to preach. Grant unto us, O Lord, as scripture says, ears that will hear. Hear not so much Pastor Ryan, but hear your still voice within us say, well done, good and faithful servants, as we respond. Loving God, we thank you for this occasion. And we thank you that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We are thankful that all history points to him, for he is the Alpha and the Omega of history. O oh Lord, bless us now. May we hear your precious word. Moreover, May we hear your spirit speak to our hearts in this morning worship. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. If you were to ask me a couple months ago what subject I am the most uncomfortable preaching about, Hands down, it's on the subject of giving. I have historically not walked into this two weeks of stewardship with the same, like, excitement from the pulpit that I have in the past. It, and there are cultural reasons for that, okay? Absolutely, there's cultural reasons for that, okay? And I know that... <laughs> Media has oftentimes loved to highlight where churches have misused money, okay? If there's, a, there's two big scandals that, that plague uh, the church and the media, this is one of them, okay? And so 
Historically, I come into stewardship, and here's the way I do it. Who's new in the church? Who do I have to intervene after the sermon, after the service is only over, and make sure I tell them, we don't always talk about money. You just happen to come on this date. I don't know what the Lord, why he put it this way, okay? But this isn't really our topic that we drive home all the time. We're not just here asking for money all the time. And it's like you just start beelining. Where are the new people? Where are the new people? I got to intervene. I got to let them know this is not, this is just a coincidence, right? And, and you know, really, shame, shame on me for that because Jesus preached a lot about it. And, and I, I need to tell you today, whether you're brand new to this church or whether you've been here a long time, I do not feel that way this time. I am excited to preach on this topic. I am fired up to preach on this topic. I feel fired up to preach on the topic of stewardship and giving in a way that I have never in almost 20 years of ministry, all right? And, and I'm even going to double down and say, you know what, for every church scandal that involves money that you see blasted all over the news and whatnot, understand something. There are thousands and thousands of church who are giving to people, who are helping people along the way, who are bringing healing to people, who are giving money to people, who are helping to raise people up. And those never get put on the media. I'm excited to talk about the movement of God in the local church. Amen. And I won't even apologize for it. If you're new here, God brought you here for a reason. God brought you here, and this is the one, and I'm going to give it exactly the way I feel excited to do it, right? Because I have always, always taken the, uh, the objective to preach to the heart of a man, to preach to the heart of people, and to deal with the heart issues, even in my own self. I'll be vulnerable even with my own self at times, and you know that. And giving and stewardship to the Lord and the movement of God through his people is an issue that speaks to the heart of a man. It does. And so I'm going to come with it today. Because the reality is, it rails against entitlement. Giving rails against hypocrisy. It rails against a movement that's all about me. It rails against individualism at the collapse of being united. It rails even against the church, local church, if it misuses and scandalizes the money. Then let the word of God speak, whether it speaks to you, me, the church, the culture, let the word of God speak on it. Because I have found that people often want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of a movement. They want to be a part of something that is bigger and beyond themselves, but not always want to give to it. Clubs, organizations, things that we put together, right? We love the idea. And right now in our culture, there are a lot of movements. There are a lot of people who feel like they need to champion this cause or that cause or this cause or that cause, right? But oftentimes it's great if it's vocative, if it's vocal. And oftentimes that excitement wanes down when it hits the checkbook. And so my thesis today I'm going to tell you a thesis for today. Only when a movement captures your heart will you joyfully give to it. Only when a movement captures your heart and not just your obligation will you be excited for this topic like I am today. i give you a little illustration, right? I was once part of a local yacht club here, and before you say, oh, that's why he wants you to give. You can own a 16-foot aluminum StarCraft, okay? It could be a 16-foot aluminum StarCraft, and you're still in, okay? I wasn't sitting on there, you know, with, like this with my tuxedo while the captain was saying, all aboard, you know? It's not that kind of thing. It's a little fishing boat, okay? All right, but I was part of this yacht club, and we had to, you know, <laughs> repair bankments to where they were starting to, to, to wither away and we had to, you know, give to it. And there was, it was always hard. And, and, you know, every organization talks about this. How do we get people to want to give of themselves to it, whether it's their time, whether it's their talent, whether it's their treasure, whatever it is. It was like pulling teeth. And I can remember when we had to go open the docks, it's like, oh, I got to take that Saturday off, right? But when our family launched Luke Stronger to support raising money for pediatric cancer, Right? In honor of, of our son's cause and how people responded to us and we wanted to give back. That was a movement that captured our heart and I never had any problems asking people to give to it. Because it won my heart. And that's the thesis for today. So let that little 
that little illustration sink in your heart today. Let's let the word of God speak to our hearts to challenge and confront us, but also give us hope about new frontiers, new opportunities, and growth. And growth. And what a better time to do it than when we just saw the March of the Light Brigade of the youngsters heading out to learn more about, about God. Amen? Amen? Now, this particular scripture lesson for today just jumped out in my devotional this past week. And I said, it's stewardship, Lord, and I think you just gave me something. And that's why I'm so excited about it. It's a, a scripture that I've never preached on for stewardship, nor have I ever even heard preached on regarding stewardship. It was just came across in my devotional. And, and it jumped out at me. And so I want to share it with you, okay? It, it's, again, it's not a typical Typical stewardship uh, scripture. If David had a sin, and I don't want to go into the, the background of it. You can read it in your own devotional, okay? But the background is he did a census, and it, he did it for reasons that were not good, and he sinned, and, and a plague came on the land, okay? That's what you need to know. A plague came on the land, and he wanted, he got a word from the Lord, and someone spoke to him. He had to go and place an offering and do, and do an offering at a, at a specific place, okay, where he was going to then have this offering in order to bring healing to the land. So all he had to do, all he was told to do is to go and make a sacrificial offering to bring healing to the land. That's it. And it's from that background that we get 2 Samuel 24, 20. Okay? Put it up there for me. And when Arona looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arona went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Arona said, why has my lord the king come to his servant?" And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Now, threshing floor, again, you don't need to know the whole background of it. It's where they put the grain, right? And they would thresh it to separate, separate the wheat and the chaff. It was often on high places where you'd hope the wind would catch and take away the, you know, the, the, the stuff that you didn't want, the chaff, okay? And you'd be just left with the good stuff, all right? And so he's going to go buy this threshing floor from Arona to build an altar, that the plague may be averted from the people after this sacrifice. Now watch Arona. Watch what he says. Remember, he's got the king, King David. If you don't know who King David is, I'll just tell you he slew Goliath. It's a big thing in the Old Testament, okay? And we'll just leave it at that. Arona said to David, let the Lord, the king, let my Lord, the king, take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledge and the yokes of oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arona gives to the king. And Arona said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Arona wants to give it. I don't want your money, King David. I got my face to the ground. I'm just going to give this to you for this offering. And watch David's response. Now remember, all David was required to do was make an offering. Okay? To make a sacrificial offering at the altar. He wasn't even required to purchase it. But watch what he does. But the king said to Arona, no, I will buy it from you for a price. Say this with me. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. And when I read that, I was like, something about that. David, because he wasn't required to do this. He just felt in his heart, I'm not going to do this without it costing me something. I am invested in what's about to happen. I want to be invested in this. He did it from his heart and not from his obligation. It was an act of devotion. He didn't want the cheapest way out of the mess. And understand, this is the king, not a pauper or a peasant, not a servant, not a jester, the king who says, I am not worshiping God if it doesn't cost me something. And you know what? 50 shekels to King David wasn't a lot. But the point is, I want it to come from here. I want God to see that it comes from here. And there's a really important note. So as that, that verse jumped out at me, I said, I got to look something up here for a minute. And wouldn't you know that God not only responds by bringing healing to the land, but this threshing floor that David purchased for 50 shekels would go on to become the location of the temple in Jerusalem that King Solomon, David's son, would soon build. Think about it. David had no knowledge of it. 
50 shekels just for this little threshing floor, what God would use to bring the temple of God to the people. And I started just peppering on that for a little bit, letting that season in my heart. And I've got three points from this passage that I think are absolutely critical to understand about stewardship and giving. Three points that leapt off the pages at me today, okay? Point one, we don't know how God is going to use our offerings to do something far greater than we ever expected. God multiplies an offering that comes from the heart. When God sees our hearts are invested, he multiplies it. You don't know what God will do. When we took on things here a couple years ago, we, did we know that there'd be how many kids just leaving out to go and worship, right? We remember, we, wasn't that long ago, we didn't even have any. You don't know how God, when he moves and he moves with the people and he sees the devotion of the heart, you don't know what God can do with something as simple as 50 shekels because 50 shekels became an altar and an altar became a temple. 50 shekels became an altar and an altar became a temple. The temple. The temple of God. And that's what God does. A manger becomes a cross and a cross becomes an empty tomb. A Nile River becomes a Red Sea, and the Red Sea becomes the promised land. That's what God does. He multiplies acts of faith. He takes seriously the devotion of our heart and blesses it beyond what we could ever imagine. That's point one. That's what God does. He takes acts of faith and obedience and becomes multiplier of blessing. Point two. Point two, God is pleased when the offering comes from the heart because before a temple is built, there's got to be a temple in here. See what I'm saying? Before all this, it's got to be in here. I want to be invested in this. I want to be part of what God's doing. The holy of holies is working within us before we see it all with our eyes. We have to see it and believe it with our spiritual eyes first. Before it becomes something that our biological eyes see. The holy of holies has to work within the heart before he finds a residence in the temple in the Old Testament. He's got to work in David heart, David's heart. I love what he says. I don't want this to cost me nothing. I want to go, I don't want to go through the motions of worship. I don't want to just come on Sunday, sit in the pew, have my little spot and leave and think I've done everything I need to do. That's not the walk of a spiritual man. The spiritual man walks in faith and in trust. The spiritual man has a heart that wants to be a part of what God's doing, a heart that wants to see other people blessed. David wanted healing to come to the land, and he wanted to be invested in it. He wanted to be a part of it. He wanted to be moved by it. The temple starts here. What God is going to do here is a vision that has to live in here first, everybody. And it's got to be something when we say, I can't wait to be a part of it. God's on the move. God's on the move. And I was thinking about this, you know, this idea of obligation versus devotion. And I mentioned this a few weeks back, and it resurfaced today. If you remember a couple weeks ago, I said, obligation is a contract of your mind. You agreed to something, you wrote down something, and now you're held to it. But devotion is a contract with the heart. It's done out of love. David was not obligated to pay the 50 shekels. He was obligated to make the offering, the sacrifice on the altar. An act of devotion is the seedbed from which God multiplies the blessings for his people. There's a difference. You don't pour out to your children because you're obliged in a contract you made. You do it because it's a devotion of your heart. 
You do it because it's something that's moved you in your spirit. David's investment in the heart would lead to the temple where one day, if you want to talk about how God multiplies blessings, think about this. I didn't even think about this one when I preached this on Tuesday, Tiff. But listen, you want to talk about the way God multiplies the blessings of a devotional heart. King David offered a devotion of his heart for 50 shekels that went on to become a temple, right, the center of Jerusalem. And one day another king would ride on a donkey down to Jerusalem and offer a devotion of his heart for all of you, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. You want to talk about multiplying a blessing. Did David could have even fathomed that those 50 shekels would not only become a temple, but lead to the ultimate king, the Messiah, to come down to pay the ultimate devotion of his heart. He'd be arrested in there, right? But God does this, right? It's just like we said from a manger to being arrested in Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to a cross, from a cross to an empty tomb, from 50 shekels to an altar, from an altar to a temple, all because the temple of the heart had to come first. Yeah, I'm excited to preach this topic for the first time in my ministry of almost 20 years. Because another king was coming down those same steps. A temple to a cross. A cross to our freedom. And I got thinking, you know, if David so wanted to be invested in his heart for the coming healing of the land... I wonder how we should be invested having already received the blessing and healing in Jesus Christ. Think about that. If David was moved to be devoted in his heart and invested in the movement of God for a coming blessing, how much more should we, having already received? This leads me to point three. So in case you forgot, in case you were snoozing back here, Point one, we don't know how God is going to multiply our blessings, okay? We don't. Whether it's 50 shekels or 5 million shekels, we don't know. Number two, the offering, when it comes from the heart, when it comes from the temple here, is the type that blesses and pleases God. And number three, and this is a big one for me, okay? This type of devotion of the heart and selflessness and giving and wanting to be a part of what God is doing and putting others first ahead of yourself, I still believe that that's the type of offering that can bring healing to our land today. Brothers and sisters, we live in the consummate I generation, me generation. And No, I'm not talking about a generation just as the younger one. I'm talking about the one that we are all living in right now. Everything is I, me, I, me, I, me, I, this, I, this, I, this, I, phones, I, this, I, pads, I, me, 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 me. We are being brainwashed, even, I'm going to go that far, through advertisements and publicity to think only of yourself. And somewhere in the midst of it, the we is crumbling like a temple whose stones have been thrown down. And I still believe that the gospel that tells us to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow Jesus, to love like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to sacrifice like Jesus, is still the answer for the world and will be until he comes in the clouds. It's what it means to be the body of Christ. This culture of entitlement, of self-centeredness, I believe the act of giving is a force to combat the me movement. It's a force to combat the I generation, and it needs to be preached, and shame on me if I don't preach it. Everywhere we look. Listen, we have a a, a verse here, and Jennifer, I know you know what's coming, right? That I have said, for the last two, like two months, I found a way to squeeze it in every time. And so is Pastor Don, right? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Giving makes sure you say, I mean it. I'm not going to focus on me. I surrender, surrender myself for the greater cause in Jesus Christ. 
I surrender myself because God's on the move. I surrender myself because I want to be part and invested in what God is doing. And I believe that is the answer. I believe in the process we will find our own freedom when we stop living for the self and start living for the movement and the people and each other and for God. Before we can ever declare I've been crucified with Christ, there should be a reality of learning to die to the self. And again, it can be tragic how people will espouse this verse until it hits the practicality of the purse. Oh, I don't know if I want to be crucified with you there, Lord. Yeah, no, I like saying it. It's fun. It's fun. We say it all every week. It's great. But the practicality of, my, of the purse? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, what if I can't get this next toy that I want so dearly? What if I don't have my fishing boat for the yacht club? Because then we got to take it seriously. It means the movement of God is more important than our toys and technologies, our garrisons and our gadgets. All these things that we build and use to portray ourselves to each other as a certain somebody, a certain identity. And Jesus says, tear it all down, surrender, and follow me. Give of yourself to each other. Giving is a restraining not only of the mind, but it's a retraining of the heart to see a movement and a moment that is greater than ourselves. And I think I'm excited to preach this so much because I see what the reverse is doing to our culture I see what selfishness and greed and thinking of only of ourselves is doing to our culture. And we as a church have to stand and counter to that even when it hits down the purse. So I Googled. Let's close you with this thought. I Googled. Um, I was going to use as an illustration, you know, the way somebody takes a small investment and it multiplies and they end up getting, you know, more blessing than they ever received. And then God, I felt, put the brakes on me. I said, I don't, I don't want you doing that. I don't want this to go back to what you receive. I don't want it to go back to what do I receive. And you can Google it yourself. There's about 14 zillion hits on how you can make an investment that's going to change your whole life. And you'll, I, I'm going to give you a hint, everybody. Red Oak Church is not in those Google hits, okay? It's not here. You're going to look for, if I give to Red Oak Church, this is what God's going to, I'm going to come out way on. We're not in the Google hits. But I felt like the Lord stopped me and said, it's not what I, what I want you to do. It's not the conclusion. I thought about comparing financial results and outcomes, but I felt led in, led in a different direction. I felt led to ask the question, what if you never see the outcome personally, but you're part of a legacy and a movement that does? There's some people in this place who've given, who've since passed away, who never got to see the 20 kids that just walked out of here and to the, learn about Jesus. What if you never get to see it? Is it still worth it? I know we all get to see the blessings right now, but just for the sake of discussion, what if the only gain that you were going to get was a devotional heart that no longer was a slave to yourself? What if that's all you got? Is that worth it? To be part of something, this movement of God here amongst us? I wonder if that would be liberating in of itself. And that led me to a closing illustration, not from the world, not from Google, not from Instagram, but from the book. And it's the story of the widow's mites. And every time the widow's mites, the widow's two coins are used, it's a whole sermon in of itself. We're not going to reboot the whole sermon, everybody. Rather, I'm going to let us imagine for a minute. Mark 12, 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money in the offering box. And rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he calls his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. 
For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And you know what? Here's the thing. She wasn't obligated to do that. She is the quintessential illustration. Because all you got is a lot more than the 10% of the tithe, even if you count the three tithes. Everything. She wasn't obliged, and it caught me, and I'm like, yeah, she wasn't required to do that. Something was a devotion of the heart and not a contract or an obligation of the mind. And I started thinking, why would she do this? And I let God just work in my imagination and ponder for a little bit. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's something more. And then I realized, you know what? Jesus' ministry, if you're reading the Gospels, was in full swing by now. And there were rumors. There were things going around. The Messiah is here. You should see people are being healed. People are being liberated. People are being set free. The Messiah is here. And I wonder if that didn't start Start working on her heart. And maybe, even though she would, might not have ever lived to see the results, because if you were a widow and you were poor back in that day, you had very little chance to survive. And I wonder if she thought, I got to be a part of this. I got to be a part of this. I got to be invested in this. He's here. The Messiah is here. I got to be, I got to. I got to, in the biggest way that I can, be a part of a movement that's bigger than myself. And I wonder, I began to let my mind wonder, did she leave feeling worried or hopeful? God's on the move. Did she leave feeling concerned or excited, shackled or free? Or maybe, just maybe, a thousand years after David secured the location of the temple, that area where she is, where the treasury is, a thousand, over a thousand years before, David, with a devotion of his heart, secured that, and God multiplied it. And I wonder if she didn't approach that and say, you know what, it's my turn for a devotion of the heart. God's on the move. God's on the move. God's on the move. And I want to be a part of it. Something way bigger than me. And I tend to feel that she left that moment not feeling enslaved, but free. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this message. We thank you for speaking through your word and through our sermon today. So Lord God, help us to sacrifice ourselves. Help us to be pure from within. Help us to be selfless and rather than selfish. Help us to be a part of a movement right here in West Springfield. Help us, oh Lord God, even if we don't see or even if we don't see the results in the future. Lord, it's good to know that you are on the move. Yes. And we can rejoice in that. So, oh Lord, we thank you for this message. Speak to everyone here. And may we give, not because we have to, but because we just can't wait to support what you're doing. For you are on the move. Amen. song and I know it is stewardship and there are some practical things that we have to do I know Kim is excited and thrilled to come up here and talk after but I want to close out our worship first and just really soak in this moment
Until I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God song is a, is a benediction on its own. You know, there's moments where we feel, all my life you've been faithful, we want to sing it out from the top of our lungs because we feel like we're on the top of the world, a room at the top of the world tonight. And I think some of the most powerful times that those words are sung is when we're sitting in the valley, when life is hard. And you look up and you say, all my life, you're still there. You've been good. I 
can remember when those words were quite hard to sing. But Lord, I, I want to sing these to you again. I'm just going to ask our worship team to sing it one more time together. Right from the chorus, all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. everybody I'm going to ask Kim if you would come up if you would share a little with our congregation about stewardship the worship service is over and I know this is a, a formality but it is important so please be seated everyone yes you, you can have the mic yes I love that you're asking Yeah, for those, Ryan talks about the people who, if this is your first time here, just so you know, it's the only time, the only day of the year that I might get up here. So <laughs> this is very unusual for me. And isn't this so, so good? So, so good. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kim Schleicher, and I'm the treasurer here at Red Oak Church. Basically, that just means I pay all of the bills and keep the trustees and leadership and all of you up to date on our finances. Um, it's harder for Ryan, I think, to talk about giving than um, it, it, to, to talk about what we receive because a lot of it is because of him. So it's kind of hard to toot his own horn. But I'm here to talk about and, and want to talk about before we talk about giving is what do we receive from Red Oak Church? I'm not going to follow Ryan's three, three things. I have seven. <laughs> There's way more. <laughs> There's way more than that, but I do have seven. So what do we get from Red Oak Church? Uh, the first thing and, and the biggest thing, and this goes along with something Ryan said in the sermon, is peace. Um, and, and like he said, what if the only gain we get is a devotional heart and we're no longer a slave to sin. I mean, how peaceful is that? And how, how much is that worth, you know? When I attend, I attend Tuesday night. Most of you don't see me, so that's the other thing. So you think I'm like not here, but I, I'm here every Tuesday. So when I attend, I often say it's the most peaceful night of my, of my week. The second thing is we get teachings. We learn invaluable lessons from a really good book and that's kind of how I thought when I, I, I grew up different and when I started coming to a church and I started reading the Bible, I was like, this is such a good book, you know? <laughs> we, we hear these lessons from, from people, mainly our Pastor Ryan and a lot of times Pastor Don, who have studied the Bible and provide solid information on God's word. I think you'll agree that all of the sermons are easy, very easy to understand and can be applic applicable to our own lives. Three, we get awesome worship music, as we just had here. Um, I mean, these guys come here, they spend so much time, and they give so much of their time for, for what we get to see up here. When I first started at uh, Ryan's Church, I was amazed that it was an entire band. I'm like, it's a whole band, you know? It's, it's just awesome. Number four, um, sometimes we get a comedy show. Some of you have seen, like, Ryan's dance moves. Mine aren't as good. Yeah. Um, Pastor Don, too, always makes us laugh. Uh, five, we get a place where our kids can learn about Jesus. Like Ryan said, all those kids that went out today, it's, ama it's amazing. Um, six, we get fellowship. Here we are. It's awesome for me to be here on a Sunday to see faces that I don't always see. And so many people here have made friends for life. We get knowledge. Uh, the knowledge that we are God's children, and he loves us so, so much, and he's so, so good. 
That's fitting good, actually. And now for the giving part. Our church runs on our money, and I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that. We're, we don't have any funds coming in from anywhere except for all of us. So we have this whole building to maintain, and we have payroll to maintain, um, and we have missions that we want to give. You know, we want to be able to give. And um, our church expenses are over $200,000 each year. Um, we give approximately, currently, $13,000 annually to missions. We'd love to have that be a lot more money, you know. So our money needs all of us to give whatever we can. Why are we asked to pledge? Because this is kind of what I, we're all asking today. Um, it just means to tell us how much you're going to be giving each year. We do this to help the trustees to make budget decisions. If we had no idea of an estimate of how much we are going to take in, then it's very hard for us to decide how much that we can spend in the upcoming year. Asking for money is a hard thing to do, for sure, especially at a time when the cost of everything is going up for all of us. We just ask you to prayerfully consider how Red Oak Church fits into your 2023 household budget, and we appreci appreciate so much anything that you're able to give. Um, so now so for, for some housekeeping, or additional housekeeping, I want to let you know that this year is going to be a little bit different than past years. To save on postage and to kind of get up with what, how things work in this day and age, the only people act receiving actual pledge cards are people who don't have an email address on file, which is only a handful of people. Bill. Where is he? Bob. 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 <laughs> Bob. Bob, not Bill. Bob. Where is Bob? <laughs> yeah. Bob's one of them, yes. Sorry, yes. Um, so the rest of you are, will be getting an email tomorrow, actually, that you're going to need, need to reply to in order to make your pledge. I've tried to make it easy for you to respond, and I'm hoping that's a result. Although when I sent this and we did a test this week and Bonnie got it, it went into her spam. So if you can, by tomorrow night, if you can look in your email and make sure you check in spam and make sure you got that message. We do have, for those of you who aren't getting it in the mail and really are like, I am no way going to do this email thing, we do have some pledge cards up near Tiffany if you did want to grab a pledge card today. So we do have some extra pledge cards. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll be around right you know, after the service. You can ask away. And uh, thank you so much for listening and supporting Red Oak Church. We're all extremely grateful. Thank you for doing that, Kim. Yeah, again, you know, if we don't have an email address for you and you're new, but you want, there are pledge cards in the back, and you, you need to know that if you, if you can't keep your pledge, we don't report you to the credit bureau, right? There's nothing like that, right? It's, you do what you can. It just helps us budget. That's all. There's no, um, like I said, this is all about between you and God, and it's a contract of the heart, not of the pen. Okay, and I just want you to know that because sometimes what God does is he takes 50 shekels and turns it to an altar. And then he takes an altar and he turns it to a temple. And from the temple, a cross, a cross, an empty tomb. And somewhere down that line, 337 Piper Road and the temple of our hearts. So go in peace, everyone. God bless you. Thank you for today.